Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to the university on this pleasant evening. We wait for the sun to shine here in Liverpool. Welcome to the university senate room. And this room is one, used to be one of two chapels. It's still sacred space, but it is a place where the university meets to make its most important academic decisions and also where it celebrates important moments. This Senate room is part of the Hilda Constance Allen building, named after Miss Constance Allen, who headed one of the three founding colleges of the university. Seeking to build her Oxford College in the north, she sent her London architects off to St. Hugh's College in Oxford to use it as her model. And she built it three times the size of St. Hugh's College, which her fellow Anglican principals at the time thought was thoroughly extravagant. But she prevailed, and like all things infused with a big vision, her college is now grade listed and has improved with time. The oldest parts of this building, you may be interested to know, are the stained glass windows. These windows were saved from the original building that uh, sadly caught fire in the 19th century in some wise soul whose name we don't know, saved these windows, and here they are in our Senate room. I'm told it is the only building in England where all the stained glass is of English female saints. I began by saying that we gather in the Senate room to celebrate important events. One of those very important moments in the life of the university are the, are the inauguration of new professors. Here we gather from across the university and across the city to celebrate, to celebrate each professorship individually and personally. Talking of those gathered here tonight, I would like to welcome especially our colleagues from outside the university. May I face the first say welcome to the Pro-Chancellor Pro and Chair of the University Council, Professor Canon Peter Wynne. And of course, members of the University Council, Judge Graham Wood, who's with us, I think, on his way. Welcome, Judge Wood, and the Reverend Dr. Chris Fallon, with us, welcome. Then there are colleagues from other universities here tonight. Uh, Professor Deverell Capps, Dean of the Faculty of Law, uh, Leeds Beckett University. Professor Maria Grant Farley from the University of Leeds Beckett as well, welcome. We have uh, with us Mrs. Gaynor Williams, Joint Honorary Secretary from the Liverpool Law Society, and Mr. John Dove, Senior Crown Prosecutor, CPS Mersey Cheshire. You are all very welcome. For those of you who may not know the university well, let me remind you that it is now 170 years since our first college was established. I began by referring to the old windows, but the model of the university goes back much longer than that. In fact, it goes back to the cathedral schools, which shaped the foundations of how the so-called West was educated and civilized. And that was 250 years before the first universities were founded. By liberal arts, I refer not to the 18th century, but to the platonic scheme of the trivium and the quadrivium, which all educated people at the time had to study. That is, the art of the word, grammar, logic, and rhetoric, and the arts of numbers, arithmetic, geometry, astronomy, and music. The foundational subjects of the university were, of course, theology, philosophy, and jurisprudence, or law as we call it. And ladies and gentlemen, the absence of these three, one can still argue today, reduces the university to being merely a grand polytechnic. Our foundation professor tonight, which we induct as the foundation professor of law, Professor Franco Rizzuto, is Italian. I should say Francesco Rizzuto. Rizzuto who is, of course, from Italy. And the University of Bologna was founded just a few years before Oxford 
and people forget that Cambridge is 100 years younger than Oxford. But Bologna's famous motto is Petrus ubique, ubique, ubique parte, legum Bononia mater, which, as you know, in Latin means St. Peter is everywhere the father of the law. Bologna is its mother. And that's how the first university formed itself. And so we celebrate tonight the establishment of the foundation chair in a, dis in a discipline that is a fundamental, fundamentally part of this university's philosophy of education. And I should add, ladies and gentlemen, not just the training of lawyers, but a legal education that is in itself necessary and sufficient for a full, for a full and rounded higher education. And that is high ambition indeed. So welcome. And it is my pleasure now to invite the Pro Vice Chancellor for Research, Professor Atulia Naga, to introduce our speaker, Professor Naga. Vice Chancellor, distinguished guests, may I also extend my own welcome to you to this inaugural tonight. This is the sixth one in the inaugural lecture series for the current academic year, that is 2021-22. And I am delighted to have this opportunity this evening to introduce our new professor and therefore our inaugural lecturer Professor Franco Rizzuto, who holds a personal chair, as the Vice Chancellor says, in fact, foundation chair in law. Professor Rizzuto joined Liverpool Hope in September 2021 at the start of this current academic year as the inaugural dean and head of the newly formed School of Law, having previously being head of law and criminology at Edge Hill University. Educated at the universities of Hull and Manchester, Professor Rizzuto has also studied European administrative law at the Academy of European Law, European University Institute in Florence. And he studied European banking and financial law at the International University Institute, Luxembourg. His extensive academic career has encompassed a number of universities, including Ulster, Hull, Cardiff, Oxford Brooks, Lancaster, and Edge Hill. Professor Rizzuto's multidisciplinary background has seen him involved in several European Commission supported projects and in training judges in community law in the European Union member states. He has a broad range of research interests including European law, competition law, public law, telecommunications and cyber law, and media law. He is a regular analyst on national and international television channels on matters relating to EU law and UK and European politics. Some of his key achievements include building a department of law and criminology that grew from five colleagues and 40 students in 2003 to one that has nearly 1,000 undergraduate and postgraduate students and over 35 academic staff members when he left uh, his previous place of work, Edge Hill University in August 2001 and came to join us. Indeed, uh, he successfully la uh, uh, led the law unit of assessment for submissions in RAF 2014 and recently RAF 2021 at his previous place of work, where 
due to his efforts, I understand 73% of outputs were judged at four star and three star category in the recently published results. He's very well published and many of his, uh, many of his refereed publications are cited in an opinion on an advocate journal of the Court of Justice of the European Union, as well as in briefing documents of the European Parliament on telecommunications law reform. He has been involved in training judges and senior civil servants in Poland and Ukraine on EU law as part of Tempus projects. And so it is a genuine delight and joy for me to invite Professor Rizzuto, our professor of law, to deliver to us his inaugural lecture entitled The Political Limits to Constitutional Compliance in the European Union, the case of Poland. Professor Rizzuto. to see everybody here because I think that it's very, very important that the School of Law in Liverpool Hope finds its niche, its place in a crowded market in the Northwest. Um, it's very, very important that we do that and I think it's very important that the word, the message goes out that, that we exist, we're special and we will do things in a particular way. And I think to, to thank the Vice-Chancellor for reminding me, actually, that the way we do law and hope to do law here will actually be rooted in the values of this university. So law as an instrument to do good uh, in, in an interesting kind of way. I think it's very important. Before I, I enlighten you on my polemic on Poland and the European Union and why politics is always more important than the law, though lawyers don't quite understand that yet. Um, having, how can I put it, uh, come from both strands to produce uh, me. Um, I just want to say one or two words about what we've achieved so far and how we hope to proceed. In the last six or seven months, I think that we have brought our programs up to date, fit for purpose in the, new, in the new arena, because the world of the law, as I'm sure many of you will know, I was gonna say constantly changed. Well, it doesn't really, but actually how to become, how to enter the legal professions has evolved, has changed. And it's very, very important for us that notwithstanding that we need to make sure that our students have that breadth of knowledge and understanding for a multiplicity of, of, of uh, careers, that actually they come here to study law first and foremost, and that if they want to pursue careers in the law, that they're equipped to do so. In that sense, I'm a little bit of a conservative with a, a tiny, tiny C. So we've really, um, I think, uh, with the help of my colleagues, of course, I think that we've now um, modernized our programs. We've introduced four-year programs. And we've done one or two other things that I think our students will benefit from. We've revitalized our um, personal tutor system, introducing academic development logs, so we go beyond the pastoral to careers, career planning, career management, as well as getting students to focus, to reflect, but seriously to reflect on what they're doing through their personal tutor meetings, rather than discuss, you know, my cat is not very well and so on. So I think we can be gentle, we can be supportive, we can be kind, but we must also ensure that the students that leave Liverpool Hope University will be highly regarded out there, because I learned in Edge Hill that is absolutely crucial. They are our best ambassadors. And I think that's, that's what I'm sure Hope always tried to do, but I'm here now and, uh, and I guess we're doing it in a particular way, let me put it that way, uh, which I hope 
graphs on very well with the traditions of this place. So that, that's what we're doing uh, and what we will be doing. We're hoping to develop, and hopefully we will have developed, the first strand of our postgraduate provision, which I think uh, is actually quite smart, if I say so myself. It's a, it will be a master's, approach, a master's program that is by research, but actually provides students with the grounding in the specialism that they want to do significant research in. So I think that in 12 months time we'll be further on. And of course, I hope, just as I'm very proud of, of my achievements and the achievements of my colleagues in EdgeHell, in, in the REF, the current REF and the previous one, I believe, by the way, in five 10-year plans. Though, obviously, I will be uh, in another place in 10 years' time, if not before. Um, but I think it's very, very important that now that we've put the bits of the jigsaw in place for um, our curriculum and the identity of our school, it's very, very important that we now not only lay the foundations, I think colleagues already are doing that, but that we build on that research profile, really, through postgraduate work, but also through um, publications, the development of our research environment, and so on. But obviously, there are only nine of us, and I hope to grow as the numbers grow. The other thing, and then I will get on to talk about my, my subject, uh, the other thing, of course, that, that we've also done is looked at the way we project ourselves, look at the way we market our degree, and so on. And I believe in the last uh, seven or eight months, um, our applications and conversions are also on an upward trajectory, I believe. It'll take a while, usually it takes three or four years, but I want us to be there, really. And I want the School of Law uh, to be there to be able to select as well as support, widen access as well as recruit excellence. So those, I think, are the things that we're about, aren't we, colleagues? Uh, hopefully. So I have a long lecture here, but I promise you it won't last longer than around about 30 minutes. Is it? That's my target. Okay. So. I thought long and hard about um, what I was going to talk about. Uh, some of my colleagues jokingly say, because I was a professor in my former university as well. So uh, any of you, anybody who emails me should email me as they do German uh, um, PhD uh, holders of doctorates in Germany, professor, professor. However, the first professor has gone. But nonetheless, in all seriousness, I did think long and hard about what I was going to talk about this evening. Uh, my first inaugural was about alternatives to membership of the European Union. Before it happened, of course. Um, in the mid-2012, 2013. Uh, but of course, Brexit has happened. Uh, and really, whilst the residues, it, it's still going on in a sense. You all know, uh, I'm sure you've all followed um, the debate about the Northern Ireland Protocol, to mention one issue. Uh, so it, it's still quite interesting. But I decided that today uh, I would perhaps talk about something that enables me to draw on my dual identity, not nat national or cultural, though I guess that is part of it as well, but my dual identity. I started off as my esteemed professor pointed out, uh, I'm multidisciplinary in background. I started off in the world of teaching pol political science, but that's too American for me. Teaching politics, because I was always fascinated by power and the use of power, and how power can be a force for evil or force for good. And in a sense, I metamorphosized uh, into a lawyer, um, 20 odd years ago now. Um, so in a sense, I went to politics first and then came to the law later. But I thought today I would actually talk on a subject that draws the two together. Um, and, and, and that's where the title comes from, really. Because there is a fundamental question that, that I really want us to think about here. How is it possible in an organization like the European Union that there are one or two member states in that European Union that basically 
not only infringe the law and the fundamental values of that union, but flagrantly disobey it. How is it possible, given that that union has the legal means to act? And I'll go through those for you, and, and I'll show you how uh, the European Union can act on the basis of an infringement of its fundamental values. How is it possible that in the last six years, the union has not done anything? Not done anything in the context, particularly of the last few months, where we are fighting, I guess, a proxy war in the Ukraine, correctly in my view, in helping the U Ukrainians defend themselves on the basis that they are defending European values. Right. And yet we in the European Union have at least two member states that are in clear breach of those values. Absolutely clear. And I'll, I'm not going to bamboozle you or bore you with details, but trust me, I've never known a situation where a member state has had so many judgments on the fundamentals, rule of law, independence of the judiciary, discriminatory policies, attacks on the media. So how is it possible? And I think you'll find at the end that the answer is that actually, for a variety of reasons, there's not the political will to act against them. So you might have all the best laws in the world, but in the European Union, at least, given the nature of the European Union, for the time being, Poland can be Poland. Hungary can be Hungary. And really, they ride, I did say it was going to be a bit of a polemic, rough shed over the fundamental values of that organization. And I believe that in being allowed to do so, the political pragmatists might say, well, that's fine. Uh, you know, we need to be political realists about this. I don't think so. I think that by not intervening, by not acting, in whatever means are available, and I'm not talking about repression or civil war or nonsense like that, but whatever means are available, by not doing that, what the European Union is, um, is allowing is, it, at its very heart, almost... How can I, I was going to call it a cancer, which is not a very nice way of putting it, but a terrible, terrible thing to grow and persist that will, of course, let me put it in a colloquial, egg on others, that the, you can do what you like and nothing will happen. So I think it's, it's important within that context to, to bear that in mind. And why that I have this little polemic, in, in a sense, against Poland, but I don't mind states electing, well, I do mind, but I respect democracy. If states want to elect um, governments that ride roughshed over their obligations, certainly a little bird came into my head and said Northern Ireland Protocol, but who want to do that, that's fine. I have no problem at all, other than feeling sorry for the Polish people or the victims of some of these practices that I mentioned. If they want to elect governments like that, fine, but go away. Do it in your own backyard, not mine. So that's what I thought I would talk about. So bringing together the law and really um, politics. And politics is, is um, as I say, generally the winner, unless, of course, you break the law. And then somebody might enforce it against you, unless, of course, you're the Prime Minister. Then you, you may not have such a challenge. Sorry, but I, I do try and pepper my comments with the odd, uh, how can I put it, sense of the absurd. Okay, so how am I going to proceed? Well, broadly, I'm going to try and deal with five issues, but only two or three minutes on each one. First, the charge sheet against Poland. Those of you who are in law enforcement, well, I'm using it now. What are the charges against Poland? What has Poland done wrong? Secondly, actually, what are they infringing? What are they breaching? A charge sheet against what? What are the fundamental values? 
of the European Union. Because if I'm infringing something, you've got to tell me what I'm doing wrong. So what are they? And here it's not me that's making it up, because I, here I put my legal hat on, if you like. No. I refer to the judgments, the definitions, the clarifications of the Supreme Court in the European Union, the Court of Justice. Ah, that's cool. We, we tend to do that, don't we? As lawyers, we, tend, we may disagree with a legal opinion, but nonetheless, once it's issued, it's the law. We respect it. So, how has the Court of Justice uh, identified and characterized the fundament, the, what I call the constitutional fundamentals of the European Union? It's important to know what they are. It's not the whole treaty. It's not the first 50, uh, 50 articles of, of the Treaty on European Union, nor the 200 or 300 and whatever it is in the Treaty on the Functioning of the European Union. Actually, the, the fundamentals of the Union are contained in three articles and the preamble. Article 1, Article 2, and Article 4. Article 1 talks about process. The Union is process and an emotional and ethical commitment to the idea of ever closer union. The UK didn't share that. You remember Cameron wanted to renegotiate that? Plus one or two other things, but fine, that is crucial. Article one and the preamble. Interestingly, I'm going through my notes rather quickly. Interestingly, the Polish Constitutional Tribunal said that the Article one is incompatible, a ever, ever closer union, is incompatible with the Polish Constitution. Article 2 sets out the values of the union. Non-discrimination, democracy, most fundamentally, with our legal hats on, the principle of uh, the rule of law. Nobody is above the law. But in order to ensure that that happens, the judiciary, uh, we have some judicial <laughs> colleagues here, uh, have to be independent. So the independence of the judiciary, those are two crucial areas. So what, why I've um, said a little bit more than I wanted to at this point on part two is because one of the wonderful, perhaps unintended consequences of the dispute with Poland is that actually the European Court of Justice has now defined not only what the fundamental values are, but if you like, the institutional shape, the value shape that national institutions must take, even though the European Union does not have the power. If you like, it's a system of conferred power. The European Union can't tell Poland the shape of its judicial system, how it organizes its judicial system. However, what it can do is say that however you organize it, it must respect these two fundamental principles. Rule of law, independent judiciary. That means, frankly, and here I'm having, I'm going into my polemic mode, that means that you cannot, you really cannot appoint judges because they are politically convenient or because they are members of your own party. You cannot, and here I'm, I'm delving into the charge sheet really against Poland, you cannot set up disciplinary procedures that make it an offence, a disciplinary offence, if you come to a view, if you rule in a way that the government doesn't like. Or it's an offence if you dare, if you dare refer a question to the European Court of Justice. In a sense, Poland and Hungary, but Poland in particular, have done those of us who are interested in the constitutional fundamentals and the rules of the game, if you like, has done us a great service. I think today we're far clearer than we were before on the constitutional fundamentals of the Union. And actually, I, I think that's not a bad thing, really. The third area, and here it really will be brief, what are the legal tools? What are the instruments that, at the disposal of the guardians of the treaty? Who are the guardians of the treaty, by the way? The Commission? guardian of the treaty, they can take actions against member states to ensure that the law is applied. They can take action, uh, actions against natural and legal persons if they infringe, for example, the competition law. But the guardians of the treaty in the EU context also involve
probably the weakest link of the Guardian, as you'll discover, the Council. It's a Guardian of the Treaty. Article 7 of the Treaty says that it's actually the Member States, through the Council, that can seek compliance with the fundamental values. Article 2 is linked to Article 7. So, those things, and also secondary legislation. Now, I'll quickly whip you through that. For the political reasons why Poland has basically got away with it. And it has. There's, there's no two ways about it. I guess you can tell that I'm not a Eurosceptic, can't you? But that's... But this isn't about Euroscepticism at all. It's about states joining a club on the basis that they actually meet the conditions of Article 2 and then reneging on it or ignoring it or actually saying it doesn't apply to us. So the political reasons. And finally, the conclusions. Now here I will be truly provocative. It's highly unlikely that the council will actually end up suspending Poland or Hungary. And the political reasons for that, I'll go through. However, however, and here I am being provocative, though I'm stealing the idea from a German colleague, hey, but the European Union, you can withdraw from the European Union, but according to the treaties, we can't throw you out. We can only suspend you. Well, actually, the treaty is an international treaty. And actually, on the basis of the treaty itself and on the basis of the Vienna Convention on the Law of Treaties, Article 60, if my memory serves me correctly, you can actually expel somebody from a treaty or an organization if they do certain things that meet certain conditions. So there is a legal way that ultimately could see Poland and Hungary expelled. But again, I'll come back to, to why that's unlikely to happen. So, the charge sheet against Hungary. I think I've already given you a clue, really. Here, if I can find my notes. Okay, so what has Poland done? Since 2015, when the... <laughs> so how shall I call it? Acronym, PIS. P-I-S. I, I can't speak Polish, but... And by the way, I... I I feel very proud of what my colleagues, my judicial colleagues in Poland have done. For many years, when this saga was started, I was saying to myself, I've trained a lot of these people, and I did. Many of them, if, if they haven't been sacked or disciplined, I thought, ah, they never really understood European law. How wrong I was. And actually, I'm very proud of what many of them have done. Um, in many ways, they've demonstrated to me, and I'll tell you why in a moment, why actually they learned very well. They learned very well because they've used some of the instruments of compliance to attack their own government through the preliminary reference procedure. So, charge sheet against Poland, in a nutshell, since 2015, they elected a government, right to elect a government, of course, but they elected a government that has basically taken Poland on a different trajectory to the trajectory that people hoped many Eastern European states would adopt, a trajectory of enraciné, I like the French term, in rooting, it's like rooting into Poland or Eastern European states, into the fabric almost, into the body of what one might call liberal constitutionalism, liberal democratic constitutionalism. Respect for values, limited government, separation of powers, and so on. The, the current government of Poland, they were re-elected last year, has gone on a different trajectory. And fundamentally, 
what the government of Poland has done, aside from its attacks on minorities, aside from its attacks on the press, is attack the judiciary, attack the judges. And they've done that, I, again, I'm not going to harbor this too long, hiring and firing of judges, retirement ages of judges, what judges can and can't do procedurally vis-a-vis -vis their own judicial system, but vis-a-vis -vis what they can do in relation to European courts. So basically, you cut them off, you isolate them. They've done all of those things, and quite clearly, not only has this irritated the Commission, because remember, in 1999, Amsterdam Treaty, five years before enlargement, anticipation that there might be a bit of a problem in Eastern Europe, we introduced the values. Originally, they were principles, but we introduced values. I don't know what the difference is. No, actually, there is a greater clarification. Secondly, we introduced Article 7 that I'll come back to in a moment. So there's no two ways about it. The Polish government has reformed its judicial system in ways that I think would be anathema to most people who genuinely believe in the independence of the judiciary and the rule of law. In fact, I have been known to say that they're doing an even better job than the previous communist regime, because actually the communists, there was no pretense of judicial independence. It was socialist legality, an expression of class interests and class power. What is this nonsense about independence? Independence vis-a-vis -vis who? These people have done an incredible job, frankly, and they knew how to attack first. First, you change those who were in the Supreme Court. By Supreme Court here, I'm talking about the Constitutional Tribunal. Those who decide what the law should be, i.e. how you interpret the fundamental laws. Then you attack the intermediate and ordinary judiciary. You then attack, of course, the Supreme Court and the Supreme Administrative Court, which would be, I guess, the equivalent for us of a, a sort of Supreme Court appeals court level. So you attack those things, name, fire, discipline, and so on. So, of course, the reaction, and, and this links up to what I was saying before, the reaction of many members of the judiciary in Poland was to not only protest, but to seek to use European law to block, undermine, oblige compliance, the compliance of the government of Poland with its obligations under the treaty on the basis of the European Court of Justice's definition of what judicial independence means and what the rule of law means. So we have that sort of curious situation. That's a charge sheet against Poland. In addition to that, now, if you like, that's 2016 onwards. Of course, the European Union responds, resolutions. We trigger Article 7. Article 7, by the way, is the article that says that if the Commission, the European Parliament, or the Council think that there might be a serious risk of um, a threat to the rule of law or the values in Article 2, and then that's the connection between Article 2, the values, and Article 7, how you deal with, with that. Um, if uh, those, those uh, institutions think that there might be a risk, they basically declare it on the basis of a decision of the Commission, usually, and what you do is then have a chat. You bring in the Poles or whoever to have a chat about perhaps mending their ways. There's a second part to that, of course. Uh, by the way, Article 7 has only been invoked twice, and that's Article 7.1, the first bit. Once by the Commission against uh, Poland, and once by the European Parliament against Hungary. Now, if you think of the misdemeanors in constitutional terms of those states, wow. You get my point about political limits, and you'll see exactly what I'm talking about in a minute. So, the charge sheet against Poland is really laden. But to cap it all, last October, the Constitutional Tribunal of Poland put the icing on the cake. 
it ruled. That is, by the way, the Constitutional Tribunal had ruled 10 or 15 years ago that the Polish Constitution was entirely consistent with the treaties. But of course, in the meantime, we got rid of all those judges that are pro-European, put in place our own political judges. October last year, essentially, they rule that um, the treaties, Article 1, as I said to you, Article 2, Article 4, and the most hated article of all that I haven't mentioned, Article 19, which essentially is the mechanism by which national courts must provide the protection given by European law to national citizens, and Article 19. So essentially, the Polish Constitutional Tribunal has declared UDI. Not surprisingly, this was a very, very controversial move. You may have come across it in the news last October. It was incredible that Poland, the Polish Constitutional Tribunal, would do that. But, but, so that we don't get too carried away with our pro-Europeanism and our defense of the European Union, hey, the Constitutional Tribunal was sparing no one. Every other treaty of importance in Europe was declared as incompatible with the uh, Polish Constitution. So in a couple of rulings, they also said that the Court of Human Rights didn't have the competence to rule, well, they didn't recognize the competence of uh, the uh, European Court of Human Rights. By the way, Poland is a member of the Convention on Human Rights, as well as the European Union, but it did not have the competence to rule on the question of the right to a fair trial and the fact that, that, uh, uh, that if you want to comply with your, with your convention rights, uh, you need to ensure that your uh, tribunals are independent and established by law. So, to be absolutely clear, the, the guns, if you like, the legal and political guns of uh, uh, the Polish judiciary, appointed by their political masters, it's not just the European Union. It's anybody who dares question the compatibility of what the government is doing with their international obligations. Now that is one heck of a, a charge sheet, it seems to me. And I really am not exaggerating it. For those of you who want to know, I'll give you all the judgments that, 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 that you may like. And this is why I think, frankly, it's politically and legally outrageous. Right. So, what are the weapons in formal terms? What do we have at our disposal to deal with, with, with this kind of charge sheet? Well, and note, except for Article 7 that was introduced in 1999, in the past, the European Union didn't think it needed a specific treaty provision to deal with infringements of its fundamental values. Remember that. Right? Not traditional instrument, Article 258, Article 260 on the Treaty on the Function of the European Union. Essentially, the Commission brings infringement procedures against the naughty state because it hasn't implemented uh, a directive, transposed a directive properly, because it's passed a law that infringes its obligations under the treaty and so on. What I would call the laws with a small L. It didn't have a provision that dealt with infringements of the law. And by the law, I mean the law, the fundamental compact that binds together, that cements together a political community, whether it's the European Union or a state that has a constitution, of course, which may be a little bit alien to us. We do have a constitution. It's just a little bit ramshackle at the moment. And our politicians can make it up as they go along. Though, of course, the English judiciary uh, has... Uh, has remedied that to some extent. So, Article 7, infringement proceedings. And if a, a state doesn't actually comply, Article 260, we can fine you. And there's also Article 279. If you fail to comply, we can also take out interim orders against you and 
earn a daily fine. There are, Poland is now facing daily fines for two failures to actually implement judgments of the Court of Justice, because that's the other part of the char charge sheet, which I think is incredible, where the Polish government has not only forbidden its judiciary from applying the rules as interpreted by the European Court of Justice, yeah, but it's simply ignoring them. It's simply saying, nothing to do with us. Well, what, nothing to do with us. We ignore, we do not recognize, because this is the sum of it, we do not recognize the authority, legitimacy, and competence of your highest court and your institutions. So, preliminary reference procedure, as I say, it's been used. It's been used very, very frequently by the Commission. Countless cases brought against Poland. The second mechanism, if you like, that's a direct way of dealing with non-compliance. I've mentioned Article 7, hardly used. I've given, I've told you twice, twice. And in a European Parliament vote of 10 days ago, that is essentially a litany of the failures of the Council. The Council, of course, is where the Member States sit. Right? And on this matter, it's with them that the bug stops. Right? The European Parliament established quite clearly twice. Whenever they do meet under Article 7, provision number one, bah, it's, uh, you know, let's have a chat. There's no record of the meetings. There are no minutes. There's no obligation to report to the European Parliament. Nothing. It just... So we actually don't... No, there are no recommendations, and Article 7.1 says you can make recommendations. There's no follow-up. I think in, in my notes, I called it, what is it? Uh, a, treaty, uh, a political bluff dressed as a treaty provision, uh, I call it, because that's what it's amounted to. But, as I say, that, uh, that resolution is very, very interesting. The second mechanism, and this has been fundamental, actually, is Article 2.6.7 the preliminary reference procedure. It is the mechanism by which, and some of you who are in the judiciary may know what I'm talking about, I'm not sure hopefully all, all others who have studied European law do as well, the preliminary reference procedure is the means by which a national court, a national judge that has proceedings pending before them, and an issue of European law comes up, they can refer a question to the European Court of Justice, who then interprets European law and gives the national court the answer that the national court applies. In principle, the preliminary reference procedure is not one about interpreting national law. It's about interpreting European law. But let's be real here. You interpret European law as a way of exposing the failings of my national law. That's how it works. This has been the favorite instrument, as I mentioned to you before, of the Polish judiciary opposed, and in my view, quite rightly opposed, to the nature of the reforms. And we've seen, again, as I mentioned to you before, that Article 267, as it has in other areas of European law, become the instrument par excellence, if you like, of uh, ensuring that the law is clarified. The duty of the court is to ensure that the law is interpreted and applied uniformly in the European Union, that the law is respected. And here, Article 267 is a gold mine, really. You can write a book on the constitutional significance of the rulings of the Court of Justice with regards to its, dispute, its rulings on questions from Polish judges. Very, very important. I've talked about Article 7, its basic structure. First of all, risk. If that doesn't work, the existence of a breach. And then, if there's an existence of a breach, the member state that's breaching can face sanctions, the most serious of which is suspension of voting rights. It is a myth that Poland or Hungary could veto a decision to have them suspended. The rules are absolutely clear. The states against whom there is an action do not take part in the vote. Ah. 
poor Turkeys don't vote for Christmas, I think is the old saying. Obviously, Poland is not going to vote to be suspended. So, Article 7. These three instruments, either the indirect route through preliminary references, the direct route through um, infringement procedures, or Article 7, are frankly not worked. Either because Poland and Hungary have flamely ignored the rulings, or because the Council has not been prepared to go the whole way on Article 7. So, over the last year or so, another whiz. Let's think of another way that is politically not confrontational. And I'll come back to that in my concluding remarks. Need to look at my watch. Oh, I've still, still got five minutes. The other whiz is the conditionality regulation. The conditionality regulation is basically a regulation directly applicable that says we're not going to give you any money, in plain language, we're not going to give you any money if you are doing things within the context of infringements of the rule of law that actually undermine the disbursement, the use of the European budget. Very, very narrow way of dealing with it. But actually, it's quite clever. However, the Court of Justice had to deal with a challenge by Poland and Hungary as to the legal basis of this uh, regulation, the Court of Justice said, of course, they have a legal basis to do it. It doesn't overlap with Article 7. It's in parallel with it. And there's nothing new in the European institutions coming up with um, rules, regulations, to protect the budget so they can do it. Now, the jury is out on whether this will actually work. Why? <laughs> because the Commission only started proceedings against Hungary a month ago. It hasn't started anything against Poland yet, though there's a lot of pressure that it does. Poland was going to get 56, 57 billion euros out of the recovery fund. Incidentally, that's the reason why, notwithstanding the fact a plague on all your values, but we like the money, is why you would think, given the position of the Polish government in terms of values and so on, why don't they just leave? No. If you're a net recipient, you don't leave. So the Commission, as I say, with some support from the member state, but essentially the Commission and the European Parliament came up with this, this view. But it's a very narrow approach, and it's narrow in scope in terms of what you can actually do. And we have to see, it has time limits and so on. I won't bore you with the detail, but will it? I don't know. I really don't know. We'll have to see. We'll know in about six months whether. But by the way, in the meantime, in the meantime, the EU is not giving Hungary or Poland any money. So, rightly or wrongly. However, so that we don't come across as being incredibly harsh and horrible, I don't know how they'll do it, but nonetheless, we may not give the public authorities any money, but we will make sure that the individual citizen recipients of EU funds will not suffer. How they'll do that, I don't know. Direct funding? But, but we'll see. So, and, in, and there are soft law measures as well that I won't bore you with, but in a sense, they are about dialogue. Now, some people may say di dialogue is fine, but after six years, no change. We have to recognize that sometimes power needs to be met with judicial and political power as well. So far, nothing has happened. But every year, I have the pleasure of reading the annual rule of law reports on Poland and Hungary. And year after year, nothing's changed. So, I think that's the charge sheet. I think we've dealt with the question of values, Article 1, Article 2. So, so that I don't 
make you all fall asleep. Too much. So why no change? Why is there political reticence in the European Council, where our great leaders sit? Not the Parliament, by the way. The European Parliament has been assiduous. The number of resolutions it's voted to actually get the other institutions to do something about the problems of the rule of law in these two countries in particular. So why? Why? Well, I came up with seven reasons, if I can find them, because I don't want to get them all wrong. Okay, reason number one, geopolitical. Poland is a buffer. We may not like them, but they're better in the tent. And especially now with Uncle Putin being rather naughty, mm, I, I know I, I sound flippant, but it's an important reason. It was one of the reasons why we allowed or the European Union enlarged eastwards. Well, they hoped that democracy would take root there, but they weren't too convinced. Otherwise, why introduce Article 7 and harden up on the values? It's a buffer, and it will remain a buffer. Second reason, circumstantial. You hope these are democracies. They might be illiberal democracies, as Oban in Hungary likes to call himself, or they might be socially conservative, regressive, reactionary uh, 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 governments, as in Poland, but they are elected. People do vote for them. So if you're in the, Europe, in, in the European Union, if you're in the Commission, or the Council in particular, ah, elections, let's hope. We throw, their people throw them out. So you rely, if you like, on the electoral cycle, what I've called circumstantial, the hope of electoral change. Well, so far it hasn't happened. And in fact, if we actually look at other states, Slovakia, Slovenia, to a lesser extent, uh, uh, the Czech Republic, not the Baltic states. Interesting, not the Baltic states. But if we look at those countries, well, they may not have had elected governments that were quite as uh, interesting as Poland or Hungary. Obama has been in place now for 10 years, 20 years, God knows how long. Uh, but the hope of electoral change. Third reason, self-interest. I'm a government, I'm a minister in a country. I know that in my country, I have people who, uh, I'll take the example of Italy. the Northern League, which is now a nationalist party. We have the uh, Fratelli d'Italia, the brothers and sisters of Italy. Hmm. Or in France, Front National. A sort of, you know, a mental a sort of juggling around in your head if you're a government, a representative of one of those states, and you know you have political forces like that in your country, what are you going to do? What happens if you end up electing people who are awkward? So, if you like, as a self-preservation, do you want to make it easy to suspend states? So you combine suspension with electoral cycle. Fourth, the ethical unity of Europe. European Union is about the ethical unity, the move towards ever closer union. You don't want to expel people. Expelling people achieves the war. It undermines the very foundation of what the union was about, even if you find them objectionable. You might think that this is, well, I actually think it's a very important reason, as equally important as some of the others. Because once you start throwing people out, once you start expelling people, and I've said to you, that's the ultimate, really, where do you stop? And what happens, let's say, if France had elected Le Pen? But you're the government at the present time. Le Pen's going to replace you. Do you want to support, set a precedent for France being suspended? So that if you get elected again, what will happen? If you like, think in electoral cycle stuff. Fourth, so this is very important. The ethos of ever closer union. Five, there is a fear, a reticence against naked conflict between member states, even mediated by 
through institutions, the fact is that in the council, you would be voting to suspend somebody. Conflict avoidance. And that's one of the reasons why Article 259 is rarely used, where one state challenges another. Article 7 is about challenge, it's not just about institutional uh, um, niceties. So, fear of naked conflict. Another reason for the trauma of Brexit. Remember, Brexit happened in 2016. Do we really want to put ourselves through that kind of trauma? The final reason. The politics of necessity. Things take time. If you want to suspend a state and you need to go through the procedures to get rid of them, time needs to fly. The European Union has rules, not about, you know, of course it has rules on suspending or getting rid, but in the meantime, what happens? In the meantime, I need unanimity to adopt the climate change regulations. I need unanimity to adopt the international agreement on setting a common threshold on corporate tax, 15% for everybody. I need unanimity. In other words, in order to do certain things, until I throw the scoundrels out, I need their vote. So you're locked in. And that's what I call the politics, really, of necessity or contingent reality. The fact is that that is also a very important factor. And the fact is, which adds to the charge sheet, of Poland and Hungary, these states have already used that weapon in the last five, six months. Poland blocked the adoption of the rules on common taxes. Not because they benefit from it, they did it because they weren't getting any money, payback. We're seeing today how Hungary is blocking the adoption of sanctions against Russia over the importation of oil. These are just two minor illustrations for so, I think that those are the reasons. Conflict avoidance, as I've already mentioned. So, in conclusion then. Sorry. In conclusion then. What's gonna happen? What is the future for Poland and Hungary? I think it all depends on what the French presidency decides to do in the next month. Will they be expelled for the political reasons I've given you? Yet, they won't. Will they be suspended? Perhaps they might, the threat of suspension might work. I think the only tangible thing that will happen is that we will hit them, we, the European Union. But as I've already said to you, I'm afraid I, I'm a Europhile. I would be, I was a professor of European law. Um, that actually, paradoxically or ironically, the most recent addition to the panoply of tools, the conditionality regulation, deny them the money so that they won't be able to irrigate their electoral clientels, so that they won't be able to spend money on ensuring they get re-elected. That is the likely immediate future of on that note, thank you very much for listening. I hope I didn't uh, bore you too much on my polemic against Poland. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Professor Rizzuto. I wonder, colleagues, in the remaining time, uh, whether there's a question or two. We'll probably only take two questions. Is there a, a question you'd like to ask our speaker? Oh, I like this audience. <laughs> a question? No? Okay, if the applause meant uh, acceptance of your polemic, then we'll leave it there. And uh, Professor Rizzotto, thank you very much. I want to just invite the Pro Vice, the Deputy Vice Chancellor, Dr. Penny Horn, to give a vote of thanks, please.
Professor Rizzuto. Thank you for your fascinating insight into the challenges faced by the EU, and for once, not about the UK's relationship and divorce settlement. Liverpool Hope is really lucky to have recruited a new colleague who has enjoyed such a long and distinguished career in academia to lead our new law school forward, and particularly to lead the university through the challenges of post-qualifying law degrees. Professor Rizzuto's research focused on the impact of the EU in the real world, together with the difficulties of how, it, how difficult it is to thrive in such an institution, particularly since the, EU, the EU strives to be an organization and a union formed on the values of respect for human dignity, freedom, democracy, equality, the rule of law, and respect for human rights. In particular, Professor Rizzuto highlighted the need for a focus on equalities between people, regardless of their gender or ethnicity, and particularly in the light of those fundamental values that the EU values so greatly. He also highlighted the respect for treaties is something that is fundamental to the EU, and we need to bear that in mind in the coming months. With an eye on current events across the globe, it's interesting that the Ukraine, looking west and seeking to join the EU, has been claimed by Russia as being a central driver of their military aggression. It will be fascinating to see whether the Ukraine will encounter similar issues to those laid out by Professor Rizzuto in relation to Poland, were it ever to successfully join the EU. As well as an impressive and rich research track record, Professor Rizzuto has also brought his excellent links to some of Europe's key institutions with him to hope. Our students will be visiting Strasbourg later this year with Franco, and this will certainly enrich their learning and readiness for a career in law or in politics. Indeed, Professor Rizzuto has overseen the launch of the new Liverpool Hope School of Law, and we've already witnessed the great benefits of this development to our students and to the wider university. On behalf of the university and everyone here tonight, I'd like to thank Professor Rizzuto, Franco, for his presentation to us this evening and to welcome him as a professor of this university, Liverpool Hope. Thank you. You will notice that I didn't uh, w welcome the department simply because you, you, you're part of the family. And I didn't also therefore in welcome uh, Judge Sir Mark Headley because he too is part of the family. But it's very good that you all could be here and thank you very much for joining us. It is our custom at this time to give our speaker a little memento of this evening. If you would receive this, Franco, as a, as a gift to remember tonight. Congratulations and thank you very much. I'm going to ask our colleague at this point to meet you at the door. Maybe you go ahead, Frank, and we will then be able to shake your hand as we leave. Thank you very much. <laughs> 